One of the challenges that we have in the Bible sometimes is, is knowing exactly who God's speaking to. I know he speaks to us through his word. But in the Gospels, each one of the Gospels is written to a specific audience. You know, the Gospel of Matthew was written to the Jews because there's a lot of references to the Old Testament and the fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, the Gospel of Mark, written to the Romans. So, you know, it was written in a way that they would understand. The Gospel of Luke, written to the Gentiles, you know, kind of to, to the world. And, and, and it revealed the humanity of Jesus. And then, of course, the Gospel of John, which was written to the early church and to the, the Christians. And, and in it, we, we, we get a revelation of truly, you know, Jesus and his nature and, what, you know, his mission. But uh, sometimes also that in each one of these Gospels, there's a different concept that's written in there. You know, uh, as it's written to a specific people, the things are uh, revealed to us in, in, the, you know, in God's heart. We're going to look at this aspect today in a, in, a, in a story about a banquet and how it would differ between the Gentiles and, and the Jews. So if you have your Bibles, if you would, open up to Luke chapter 14. We're going to start there and... I'll ask you to maybe put something there to mark it. We're going to bounce around on a couple of verses here, uh, a couple of books, and then we'll be back again. But Luke chapter 14, we're going to start out at this, verse 15. Excuse me, my voice is starting to crack here. And this is the parable of the great banquet. Again, Luke being written to the Gentiles, they, you know, us Gentiles, we understand food, don't we? We understand a banquet, you know, and, and then this day and age when they were to give a banquet, it, you know, it was not, not, no small undertaking. You know, uh, the, the master of the house, you know, would plan it ahead of time. And he would send out invitations ahead of time saying, hey, reserve the date. On this date, we are going to have a feast. You know, because it's not like you walk to the refrigerator and take out a prime rib and just, you know, ready to go. You know, there's a lot of preparation that goes into this. Then the day of the feast, he would send out, you know, his servants with the, the other invitation. Come on, soup's on, let's, let's eat. You know, so it was something that was planned out. It wasn't like you just called up your neighbor and said, hey, you want to come over for dinner? You know, okay, so this was a banquet. And again, this is a parable. You know, parables are stories told to, to, to you know, show us the truth through this story. You know, they, they parallel the truth. So not everything in them is doctrinal, but the, you can definitely see doctrine in these stories. So we'll start out again in verse 15 of Luke chapter 14. And it says here, when one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, blessed is the man who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servants to tell those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married. I can't come. The servants came back and reported this to the master. Then the owner of the house became angry. Why do you think the owner of the house became angry? He'd gone to great efforts to prepare this banquet, hadn't he? I don't know about you, but have, have you ever put on a feast at your own home? You know, it's like, you know, especially around the holidays. You know, you, you do all this preparation, and then and, and, and all of a sudden all your guests would say, no, I don't want to come. Sorry, we're, we, we're too busy. It'd probably make you a little upset, wouldn't it? Well, here, you know, again, Jesus is telling this story, and you can hear the undertones already. Uh, of this banquet that has been prepared. And really, this banquet has been prepared for his chosen people. You know, and, and ultimately, you know, the, we're going to experience a banquet as God's people. 
you know, the church, you know, you, you read the book of Revelation, you know, in, in the back, you know, we always hear, I read the back of the book and we win. Not only that, or, you know, there's being a, a feast prepared for us too. We've been invited. But we'll look at that here in just a second. But it goes back and, you know, verse 16, we'll back up and it says, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. You know, here, you know, we know the truth that God had invited the nation of Israel. They, you know, they started out as a little tiny people, you know, through Abraham, you know, and his household. And they had grown into a vast number. And, and, and the Lord's saying, hey, you know, I invited them. And it goes on to say, but they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I had just bought a field. I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Uh, the, you know, the, we can see that as a lie right up front. And have you ever bought a place without going and looking at it? You know? No. But he's saying, you know what? I, my possessions really, are, I, they're more important to me than your banquet. Even though you told me about this, you know, months ago or weeks ago, you know, I'm just too busy. My stuff is more important to me. It couldn't wait till tomorrow. You know, the excuse was made. And not only him, but then the next one. It says, I have just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. You know, any of you ever deal with used car salesmen? How about used ox salesmen? Oh, yeah, you know, pulls great. Only got three legs, but he's strong. Don't worry about him. He'll, he'll do the job for you. Oh, yeah, he's blind. Yeah, no, no but he knows where he's going. Just, just point the way, right? No, you would, you would already know what you're going to buy. But five yoke of oxen? You know, I, I farm. Or I, I, I used to, and I lease it out right now because I've got too much other things going on. If I had to go buy a new tractor right now, that's expensive. Mm -hmm. You know, tractors can be two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars right now. Mm -hmm. You know, back in the day, these oxen were the tractors. He's buying five tractors. That's a lot of money. But you know what? I, I know a lot of people. You know, even the farmers of today, they're too busy come the Lord's day to come and worship mm -hmm. or, or to do the things of God. Their business is more important to them. I, I've experienced it firsthand and I can testify to this. You know, when we were raising hay, you know, there was those guys out there that they're working seven days a week at it and we would always honor the Lord and stop, uh, on, you know, and, and go to church. And God always blessed us. It seemed like our hay was always just as ready as theirs was. And he took care of the rains for us. I mean, I've seen my wife out there praying many times. Here comes a rain cloud, and she's praying over the hay, and the rain would go whoop right around us. Power of prayer. But for this individual, they, they were more worried about their, their business. I'm growing my business. You know, I, I already bought five yoke of oxen. I don't know what they look like. I don't know if they can even pull, but I'm going to go check them out. Can business wait till tomorrow? Probably knew ahead of time if they're good or not. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I I've known a few Jewish businessmen. They're very shrewd at their business dealings. It says, still another said, I got married, so I can't come. How many wives don't want to go to a free meal, a banquet? Don't have to cook. Don't have to cook. But, you know, we're told, you know, and, and, you know, in other places in the Bible that you know, when you get married, the, the cares of this world are going to overtake you. You know, because now you're worried about your wife and your family and your house and the dogs and the cats and all those different things. They become, uh, you know, something that you worry about. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's kind of what we get here. This guy's like, I just got married. I can't come. Okay. Now, do you see any real legitimacy in any one of these excuses? <clears throat> Not really. But again, this is a picture of the nation. You know, God's people. God had invited them to a banquet. You know, to, you know we're told that you know, when Jesus arrived in Jerusalem at the triumphal entry, he wept over Jerusalem because he says, you should have known. 
the day of thy visitation. He told him all the way back uh, with the prophet of Daniel the exact day he was going to arrive. And they didn't have a clue. And he wept because he says, now your city's going to be left desolate. It's all going to be wiped out. And then it says, the servants came back and reported this to the master. Then the owner of the house became angry. Like I said, I'd like you to keep your place right here, but if you would, now let's turn to this. Some, it's a similar story. It's in Matthew chapter 22. A little different audience, but it's the same idea because Jesus is trying to speak to the, to the, 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 the people of Israel to the nation because that's when he first arrived that was what his ministry was about he's gone to seek and to save the the, the lost sheep of Israel and to be the Messiah he, he's fulfilling prophecy right now and he's speaking to them and in Luke he was speaking to the Pharisees and the experts in the law here in Matthew he's speaking to the chief priests and the Pharisees so it's a different occurrence but it's the same kind of message Matthew chapter 22, we'll start out at verse 1. And it says, Jesus spoke to them again in a parable saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. Again, the gospel of Matthew is written to the Jewish people to prove that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the promised one. Okay? So they would understand this. They, they, they were a nation that had been ruled by a king. Now they're under Herod and, and you know, not the king that they want. Okay? And in verse 3 it says, He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come. But they refused to come. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. It, it wasn't only just the, the, the announcement, you know, the days before and then the announcements the, the day of. But God had been sending out his message to his people for a long time. The prophets. You know, from David on, you know, the, the, the messianic prophecies had, had been given and, and, and the nation of Israel should have been looking for that fulfillment, but yet they weren't. And it says there, come to the wedding banquet. Verse 5, but they paid no attention and went, went off. One to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. So we get a little bit more of the story here. You know, God remembers what he had done. He had sent his servants, the prophets, to tell the nation of Israel, come to this banquet. I have prepared this for you. I want to bless you as a nation. And yet they paid him no attention. Not only did they mistreat his servants, they killed them. You know, the, the, the ministry of a prophet in the Old Testament was not a, a pleasant ministry. You were mistreated. Some of them were killed. Some of them were sawn in two. By, by God's people, by the nation of Israel, that's how they treated the prophets. Verse 7 says, you know, we said that the king was angry in that last room with the master of the health. Here in verse 7 it says, The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. This didn't happen just once. It happened multiple times. The Babylonian armies came and besieged the, the city of Jerusalem and, and destroyed the temple and wiped out the city itself. You know, the, the walls were breached and, and Israel was taken off into captivity. But again, it happened in 70 AD. There wasn't one stone left upon another. And Jesus had wept and he had prophesied that, you know, the destruction was coming. Even your little ones. And that's what it saddened Jesus. Because they hadn't, they hadn't done what God had asked them to do, to come. 
And really, that's the same message God has for us. Just, just come. You know, all they had to do was believe that the king was giving a banquet and show up with the invitation. And God would take care of the rest. The king would. It goes on to say, verse 8, Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. Go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, both good and bad. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. The nation of Israel, they rejected the invitation. But the king, he wanted to honor his son. He wanted there to be a festival, uh, you know, a celebration. He says, go get everybody. Good and bad. Well, guess what? That's us. The Gentiles. You know, good, bad, you know, sinners. That, that, you know, we're, we fall right into that category. But it, it, it's our blessing now. We didn't deserve it. We weren't initially the ones invited, but you know, it, it, you know, God says, "I want my my banquet hall to be filled for my son." Keep your finger right here. Turn back to Luke. Let's let's look at that a little bit more. Luke chapter fourteen. We finished off at verse twenty-one, kind of halfway through the middle. Back there in verse 21, it says, Then the owner of the house became angry. Why? Because they had rejected the invitation. And now he says, And ordered his servants, Go out quickly into the streets and, and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. The poor. Remember Jesus said, that Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That was us. Poor. I got nothing to bring. I don't have a gift that's worthy of a king or his son. You know, that's one of the traditions. You go to a wedding banquet and you bring a gift, right? Usually it's, you know, Tupperware or some, some weird thing like that, right? What would you bring the creator of the universe? You know, back when he was born, they brought him gold, frankincense, and myrrh, but that ain't enough. That ain't worthy of a king. True, truly. Poor. The crippled. Again, that's us. I can't stand on my own. I don't have the strength. But yet, what, what, remember the story? Jesus healed the crippled. Arise, take up your mat and walk. I can't do that on my own. You know, we're, and, and, you know, and the stories in the Bible are talking about physical things, but you know, in a lot of ways they're spiritual things and how they apply to us. The blind. Spiritually, man, America, the world around us is blind. They don't see the things of God. You want to pray for somebody, pray that the Lord open their eyes to the truth, the, the gospel message. How many of us were blind before God opened our eyes? Yeah. And the lame, yeah. He pretty much described me right there, all the way through. And that's who he says, go out and invite these people in. The message, you know, the invitation's open. Whosoever will may come. Verse 22 says, Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and make them come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of these men who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. The nation of Israel. Right now, you could see back in that description, are they poor? Are they crippled? Are they blind? Are they lame? Yeah. But they're just like us. The invitation's open to them too. But he says, all those, you know, the Jewish people, the, the, the Pharisees and the, and, and the, and the uh, chief priests and all those religious people, he said, they're not going to taste because they can't perceive the invitation. They're not listening. They've got excuses. Mm -hmm. I don't need to come to your banquet. I'm good. 
I'll make it to heaven on my own. No, they can't, can they? Well, let's look at that just a little bit more. Turn back to Matthew now. Because again, the nation of Israel, you know, they thought they entered, they had the law, they got the prophets, they got all that stuff. That's, you know, how they're going to be righteous, right? The law is going to justify them. Well, we've got a problem there. Matthew chapter 22, we finished off at verse 11. Well, let's back up. Both good and bad, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. Okay, talking about the Gentiles and all those who were not of the nation of Israel. <clears throat> Verse 11 says, But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, he asked, How did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Again, going back to the traditions and the, the customs. If you were invited to a wedding feast, the clothing was provided, the, the, you know, the, the robes. You know, and, and usually they were quite ornate or you know, they were you know, something that you know, wouldn't draw attention to yourself because the, the center of attention was the bride and the groom. But here's somebody, let's just say they're wearing red in a sea of white. How, how obvious would that be? It's like, uh, excuse me, you're, you're, not, you're not dressed correctly. How did you get in here? You know, and to me, that's a picture of those who think they're going to get into heaven by their own works. See, God has prescribed one way and one way only to come to him. And that's through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. But there's those that think, I'm going to get there on my own merit. Surely God will take notice of me because I've done all these good things. I've given to the orphans and, and, I, and I've fed the hungry and I go to church regularly and I put money in the, you know, in the offering plate and all that stuff. So you know, I, I'm go, earning the gold stars on the, on the wall, right? God's looking down and saying, you, you're not dressed correctly. And I've heard a lot of people also say, when I get up there, I'm going to give God a piece of my mind. I will argue my case. Notice this man, it says, the man was speechless. In the face of the Almighty, you're going to fall to your face. There won't be any argument. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. See, this individual wasn't dressed right. We are told that we have to be dressed correctly for heaven. Is it in our righteous acts? In our own deeds? Jesus. It's in Jesus. I mean, we've looked at that in the past. You know, our righteousness is found in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. It's in him that we are justified, in him that we are sanctified. It's in him that we are declared to be in right standing with God. And it's only in him that we are dressed correctly for the wedding feast of heaven. One more passage and we'll be done. Turn with me to Zechariah chapter 3. If you're in Matthew, go back to chat, or two books. The, ending, the last book in the Old Testament is Malachi. The one right before that is Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 3. We'll start out at verse 1. Now... Here is a very prophetic book. But here we, we have a heavenly scene of Joshua. He's the high priest now after the, the nation has come back from captivity. It starts out in verse 1 and it says, Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. Do you realize that's what Satan does? He's the accuser of the brethren. Mm -hmm. He accuses before the Lord saying, look at that person. They're a sinner. 
Lord, look, they, they failed your commandments. Look at that one over there. They committed adultery. Look at that one over there. They had bad thoughts. That one over there is greedy. Constantly accusing. And for a lost world, that's what they hear. God will never accept you. You've done too much. You're too filthy. You, do you realize what sins you've committed? Do you think the Lord will truly forgive you after what you did? Any of this sound familiar? Because that's what he does. He hates mankind. Because we were created in the image of God, and he hates that. He thought he was the number one in heaven. He was the, the, the anointed cherub that led worship in heaven, and, and he thought he was something special. And then he found out that we were created in God's image, and God's affection was upon us. So now he's there to accuse. Verse 2, it says, The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord, who has chosen Jerusalem, rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched <coughs> excuse me, from the fire? Isn't that what each and every one of us was? A burning stick that was snatched from the fire? We were on our way to a fiery doom. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. He says, you know, Joshua, he, you know, yes, he's a sinner, but I saved him. I snatched him out, and he's my chosen one. Yeah. Verse 3 says, now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. The angel said to those who were standing before him, take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, see, I have taken away your sin." and I will put rich garments on you. Then I said, put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him while the angel of the Lord stood by. Joshua, he was a high priest. You know, as far as the nation was concerned, you know, he was the only one, he was the most right with God because he was the one that had to go in and offer the atonement sacrifice once a year as high priest. He was about as, as, as good as it gets for the nation of Israel. And the Lord looked down and said he was covered in filthy garments. That's us. All our righteousness is like filthy rags. Same for Joshua. You know, he, he was a religious man. You know, he, 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 he is the one that implemented all the temple worship. He was the one that represented the nation of Israel. And he was covered in it. You know, the, the, the language there would basically would, would imply excrement-stained garments. It doesn't get much worse than that, does it? And the angel of the Lord, who we think is the pre-incarnate Jesus, he, he looked down and he says, I've taken your sins away. Only God can say that. And we talked about that a little bit in Sunday school, you know, with the lame man. He says, you know, the, the lame man was there and he says, son, your sins are forgiven. And that, that made the, the religious people just infuriated. Mm -hmm. Only God can do that. You're right. Only God can do that. But then Jesus said, just so you know, he, he told the, the man, rise up and walk. But for us... We've been given these garments, the garments of righteousness, because of what Jesus has done. He is the one that proclaims it. You can't earn it. You can't sneak into the wedding banquet without them. For those who think that they could, eternal separation from God awaits for them, that weeping and gnashing of teeth. Many are invited, for whosoever will may come but few are chosen. If you're wondering if you're chosen or not, God says, I only choose those who believe my son and his gift to humanity. Those are the chosen ones. Mm -hmm. You can find an example of that in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, I think. 
When you believe in Jesus Christ and put your faith in him, we're included. But as the church, we get even a bigger bonus than that. We become the bride. Not only are we invited to this banquet, but we're the guests of honor with Jesus as our Lord, as the husbandman. By just believing? By just coming to the invitation? Well, yeah. The wedding banquet, again, you showed up, and then the, 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 the master of the house took care of what you wore, what you ate, and where you were at. Same thing applies to us spiritually. The invitation's open. He's calling out to us, saying, come. Come to me. I'll clothe you. I'll feed you. I'll take care of you. Your sins will be forgiven, but you have to come to me in the prescribed method. Mm -hmm. The nation of Israel struggled with that. Why do we have to come to Jerusalem? Can't we work, worship over in Bethel? No. It's only by coming to God in the prescribed manner can we enter into his presence. And again, that is only achieved by his son, Jesus Christ, accepting the gift. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The story of the banquet. You know, for the nation of Israel and for a lot of people, they struggle. They come up with excuses. I'm too busy. Maybe, maybe uh, you know, I got things to do. When I get older, I'll come to God. When I, when I get older, I'll get right with God then. But now I'm going to have my fun. The problem is, is none of us is guaranteed another moment. Heart attacks, vehicle accidents, you name it. You know, we don't know when our end will come. One of the things as a pastor I, I, I have to do or I get to do is I, I preach at uh, funerals. You know, and, and on a headstone, we remind people, you have your beginning date and you have your end date, your expiration date's there. And our entire life is surmised by that little tash between the two dates. While we have time, while we're still in that little dash, let's make the most of the opportunity and accept that invitation. Because I guarantee you, this banquet in heaven, it's eternal. It never ends. It goes on and we get to spend eternity in the presence of God. You know, that's what the world's missing right now. That's why the world is in so much turmoil, because they've got an emptiness inside of them that nothing fills. No yoke of oxen, no purchase of land, no marriage. Nothing fills that void except for God himself. That's what we're, create, what we're created for, is that relationship with God. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you Lord, for, for all of the things that you teach us. Lord, it's not about us. It's about your invitation and your gift to us. Lord, you clothe us in righteousness because of your Son. You forgive us our sins because of your Son. Lord, and all you ask is that we respond to the invitation you give to come to you, to believe in what you have done. Lord, so much of the world right now is, is so full of wickedness, so full of godlessness. Lord, I pray, Lord, that once again you'll pour out your spirit upon this world. But it starts with us, Lord, we know that. Revival always starts in a place and spreads. I pray, Lord, that you will cause the revival to start in each and every one of our lives so that we may, we may honor you and glorify you. We thank you and we praise you. And we ask for these blessings now in Jesus' wonderful and precious name. Amen. Amen.